Shalom. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining iTech's Lunch and Learn series. Um, just a quick housekeeping checklist before we begin. We ask that everyone stay on mute, please. Like, keep watching your mute because we've had buzzers and things going off. Um, but you will be on video. We see you. So don't take us anywhere. You don't want us to see. Um, we will open the floor for questions at the end. You can submit your questions through the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, and Jackie Gladstein will ask on your behalf. And today, we feature an intimate conversation with Andy Rahm, Israel tennis legend and former Grand Slam winner, moderated by our board member, Dan Diker, and followed by a discussion with iTech alumnus, Igal Moskov, who, thanks to iTech, he graduated with a degree in business from Yeshiva University on a tennis athletic scholarship. So I am turning this over right now to Dan and Andy. And hey, Wendy, thank you. Everyone. This is a, a, another family event at, uh, at Israel Tennis and Education Centers, and, and it is, is such an honor. Jackie uh, Gladstein, thanks, and Wendy, wonderful. And every I see the whole family here around the table. Um, and uh, uh, together I see, I know Ian's with us as well. And I remember uh, back in 1977, um, when uh, I first met Ian and Bill Litby and Harold Slanisberg at the old Forest Hill Stadium, um, and, and we got into a, a, a chat about what the, what the dream and the vision of Israel tennis at that time was called the ITC, and we've, ex we've expanded and, and improved the name to ITech, but what ITech's vision was, and I think tonight's discu today's discussion is really the culmination of, of what that dream was when you think about having a world champion. Um, and I know that that was, you know, with Ian being an, an international player himself from South Africa and then from Israel, uh, the idea about the Israel Tennis and Education Center actually producing a world champion was, was just so, it was such a dream and, and a fantasy. And here we have, uh, uh, Andy Rahm, who not only is a graduate, but represents the best of, of character and, uh, and, and, and athleticism as a world champion. So, I, I mean, it is such a treat for me and I think for all of us uh, to, to chat with Andy and get his thinking um, at such a critical time for Israel, for the United States, um, for all of us around the world, for all kinds of reasons, and, and how uh, ITEC really is a, is a ray of light in, in what can be argued to be a little bit of a dark period right now. So Andy, I want to, uh, uh, Andy, I, I know that you're, you, you were born as Andreas, so we'll, but, but now we call you Andy. Um, but Andreas is a great name in the professional tennis world, right? So like it has that, it has a, a, a zing to it. But Andy, you're retired now six years. You're a three-time world champion, Australian, uh, uh, Wimbledon Australian, um, French, can you can you help us understand uh, when you look when you drive in the car today, six six years later, what sticks in your mind in terms of your career as a uh, as one of the greatest tennis players of our generation? Um, what 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 comes up in your mind when you're waiting in a red light about your career? You can share with us. Tell us just uh, share with us an intimate thought about your career when you, when you look back, as I'm sure you do every day. I tell you what, I tell to myself every day, how stupid could I be to pick tennis? This is what I think to myself. <laughs> Why tennis? <laughs> there are so many other sports, it's crazy, you know, but uh, to be honest, um, I'm very fortunate, really. When I, I, now I look backwards, I can relax after such a long career. Um, I'm very satisfied. Oh, the achievement I did, I had through my career. And it all started obviously many, many, many years ago. Um, as a little kid coming from, East, from Uruguay. I was born in Uruguay, coming to Israel when I was five years old. And from not, I wouldn't say poor family, but we didn't have so much money, you know. And uh, my father was a sportsman, he was a soccer player, he got injured in his knee. Uh, three surgeries, and he didn't want his son to play soccer. He wanted uh, his son to have a net to separate between me and my opponent. This is how I got into tennis. And the solution we had was the tennis center next to our home in Jerusalem. Um, 
which uh, at the time was a great solution. We didn't have to pay money to play to learn tennis. And this is where I started. When I was five and a half, I started to play tennis to hold the racket and did my first steps into tennis. Now today I'm 40. Been in tennis uh, 30 years, almost uh, uh, 16 years professional. Long, long way, which all started there in the, in the tennis center in Jerusalem. Um, day in, day out, lots of work, many hours of practices, and spending most of my days at the tennis centers. Uh, now when I look backwards, you know, and I go and I work uh, every once in a while, not every once, almost every day, I'm going out to the tennis center in Ramata Sharon, I see those little kids that are going there and practicing and smiling and laughing and playing with each other and making friends, and I'm jealous. I'm jealous on this great time I had uh, growing up. Um, having my second home uh, at the Teddy Center in Jerusalem, uh, remembering the days, um, you know, as a little kid, going after school with the bag already, it's the tennis bag, going there, doing my stuff over there, if I had to do my homework, if I had to, you know, play with my friends. My practice was only around 6 o'clock, between 6 to 8. I was going there from 2 already in the afternoon, hanging around, playing, eating, do everything waiting for my practice, six to eight, having my practice, and going home only around 8, 8.30, going home. So basically I had my school from eight o'clock in the morning till one o'clock, let's say, and then straight to the tennis courts, the tennis center in Jerusalem. And that was my life, you know, growing up almost from six years old to 14. That was my growing up there. So I spent a lot of my time in tennis. And then obviously I decided to take it more professionally and I decided to leave home. And when I was 14, I decided this is uh, my passion. This is what I wanted to do. And uh, I left my father, mother, my brother, sister, and I went to a sports institute um, not far from Ramat Sharon. And that's where I spent most of my time. I took it really professionally. If I, until I was 14, I used to practice two, three hours a day. Uh, in this sports institute, I was practicing seven, eight hours. I took it more professionally. And uh, that was a lot of sacrifices, you know, like as a little kid, you can succeed, I think, in the top level if you don't sacrifice a lot. And, uh, and it means that you can't, you know, go to all those parties that your friends are going and do other things that, you know, normal kids, I guess, do. And, but, but as a little, as a kid, as a youngster, I, I never looked at that as a sacrifice because I learned so much from the tennis, from the practices, from going overseas and competing and meet a lot of people. Some of them are now here. I'm looking um, on them in this great Zoom. And what I received from tennis, um, I don't think I can receive from any other place. Uh, I know many other athletes in Israel, top athletes. I can tell you in soccer, in basketball, and other art and sports. And I can tell you that none of them, top athletes, no matter what, um, um, had received so many um, how do you say the, so many great moments, you know, and uh, experiences, and uh, like I did in tennis, and uh, you know the cultures I I got to know, and the, all these countries. What, what I received from tennis, I can't even describe in words. And it's funny, I don't find it crazy. I see all those faces here, and I know it's all and most of it, I guess, and all but most of it is because of you, the people that are looking at me now. And before I start and speak about my career, it's, uh, I wanted to start and to say it's a great opportunity for me to thank you all. First of all, of this Zoom, and for me to thank you because of people like you that put your money and donating so much money into Israel, into the tennis in Israel, people and players like me had the opportunity and chance to win Wimbledon, to win those great uh, and bring those great achievements for Israel. So, and I know it and I appreciate it every day of my life. I know what I received from the tennis from, like I told you then, from the first days, I stepped in the tennis center in Jerusalem when I was five and a half, and until today. So, and we will keep talking now, probably. I can tell you that everything I have in life, and I'm not saying it, you know, like everybody say, I have because of the tennis, tennis centers. It's funny to say, I don't know if you see it on the back now, you're gonna see kids. And my wife, I met her through the tennis centers. She grew up in the tennis center in Arad, and then she moved up to the tennis center in, in Beersheba. And we met when we were 10. And when we were 16, we kissed the, our first kiss. 
and we're together now for 24 years with three kids. So it's not that I'm saying everything is because of the, everything is because of the tennis center. So if not people like you, I probably wouldn't have three kids now and this great house. And so this is before I start, just to tell you all very thank you for your support in the past, in the present, in the future. And let's start talking. I will answer any question you want. Then obviously, as you know me, I need one question and I throw everything. I start telling you, you have to stop me because you know I can go with my stories everywhere. I have a question. <laughs> I have a question, Len Rashkin. Wait. Jackie, can you hear me? We can. Sure. Um, Dan, did you want to hold questions to the end? Let, or do uh, you yeah, I, I just wanted to I just wanted just to outline the conversation and if we could just hold off for a minute, I just uh, and, I'll, and I'll keep maybe we'll uh, just keep Andy a little bit shorter on this one. But, you know, Yoni Ehrlich is also is on this call and you and uh, you, uh, you and Yoni uh, basically not only tore up the grass, but you tore up the tour. Um, coming, being ranked in the top five in the world, I think even one and two, and being in the top five for some years. W what was it about your chemistry between you and Yoni that brought you to world championship? Well, I'll tell you the story about me and Yoni. Yoni and myself, he, go, he was growing up in the tennis center in Haifa, me in Jerusalem. I know him since I was 10 years old. He's uh, the age of my brother, and I know him for many years. Yoni, he knows it now. <laughs> All my life, when I growing up, I was three years younger than him. And so in juniors, he was always much better than me. My dream was always to play with Yoni. I was looking at Yoni as like an idol, you know, I wanted to play with him, I wanted to play with him. And he was looking at Andy as like this little kid that, oh, I'm not gonna play with him, he's not good enough. Growing up and uh, finishing the junior, um, in one tournament, I asked him to play with me. He was main draw and he decided to go and play the qualies just to play with me. And this all started in 2001. We start playing the qualies at the, the Queen's tournament before Wimbledon. We qualified to this, to, to this tournament. We won our first round, it was our first ATP match we win together. And we lost in the second round of that uh, tournament in Queen's. And so. in 2001, after this no, tournament... Sure. So after this tournament, in 2001, um, we kind of, we felt that we can do well together because we were, we were both very aggressive. We had the, the right tools of, on what doubles player needs to have. And we, we kind of complete each other on our, the way we play, in our energy, uh, the fitness, all this aspect of the game, we kind of complete each other. And um, I think the key of our success is the respect that we have for each other, the, posit the, the positiveness that we have for each other. I think uh, something that uh, me and Yoni had that he, he didn't have it with any other of the Israeli players is the way I looked at him. And always I looked on the positive things that Yoni had. Um, always uh, gave him, you know, like good, good words and encouraged him like, of, like doing the good things. And I never looked on his negative things and he has some negative. If you look on his baseline, he's not the best baseline player on earth. <laughs> but I always decided to focus on the good thing, the, the great serve, the volley, his returns, and I think um, the way I looked at Yoni with this positive way, and the way he looked at me, um, that was the key. Um, earlier in our career, when after the first uh, year that we played together, we decided that uh, it's not enough just to play together. We have to specialize in doubles. And what we did, not too many people know that, and early in our career, we decided to take a, to go and work with a psychology. Now, she wasn't a sports psychology. She was a couple therapist a psychology. <laughs> and she, she, she helped us a lot by giving us tools wow. on how to communicate well, especially on pressure, under pressure, when we play on a lot of money and points. We have so much things that we can win, earn, or lose. And she gave us many tools on how to communicate on those moments. You know that uh, tennis is a very dynamic uh, uh, match. Uh, you have 20 seconds between points to take decisions, uh, to take a, a crucial decision sometimes. And we, we learn on how to communicate, how to, for example, how to write the right questions. Questions that start with how and what, sorry, how and what, yes, are much better than why questions. When you start the question with a why, 
it's not a good question. It's, a, it's going for a criticize. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Anyway, she gave us many tools on now not to use uh, such words like but or so. And this is something like, then, like we, we used to work on our fitness. We used to work on our foreign backend on the shots. We used to work sessions after sessions on our communications. And she helped us a lot. She's from the US, from Denver. And she just made Aliyah to Israel uh, last month. But uh, so she was the secret, I think, of our career. And she helped us a lot. Uh, that's why we communicate that well for 15 years. Um, we played and uh, we stayed at the top for many years. And uh, yes, uh, this is part of it. Andy, last, last outline question before we open it up to our audience and you can, we can you know, have more of a roundtable discussion. What, the, the tennis center, the tennis and education centers have been challenged as federations have all over the world today about producing champions. Uh, it's much more expensive, it's much more complicated, it's much more involved. Help us understand from your experience what it will take for the Israel Tennis Education Centers to produce another Andy Rahm, Yoni Ehrlich, Amos Mansdorf, Gilad Bloom, Shlomo Glickstein, and, 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 and the rest. What, what, do we need, what do we need to focus on? Wow, I think first of all, the ITC, they're doing a great job at the moment. They're focusing on high performance uh, much more than in the past. They understand that uh, a, a champion will bring thousands of kids to play tennis. When you have a champion, when you have a Grand Slam champion, when you have a Davis Cup team, it brings a lot of uh, new kids. It's, it's much easier to attract the new kids to play tennis. Um, I think uh, well, it's a tough question because I tell you what, to be a professional athlete, a tennis player especially, um, it's different than just be a player. Because to be a professional, it's a puzzle, you know, of 100 different pieces. You need a great coach. You need a, a supportive family. You need finance. You need fitness. You need so many things, mentalists. You need so many things um, that are going to work all together and well with each other. Um, what I think one of the important things um, are obviously coaches. I was lucky with coaches. I think this is something that the uh, ITEC uh, definitely has. The best coaches in Israel, uh, the best educators, I call it. So not, not only coaches, because uh, the greatest tennis coaches are not the best uh, tennis players. They're, they're, you don't have to be a great tennis player to be a great coach. This is something I always say. You need the passion. You need to, for, to be a good player, to be a good coach, to be a good business, you need passion. You need to love what you do. And this passion, you bring to the kids. This is the first thing, I think, a big uh, thing of the puzzle. And this is something I think the ITEC definitely has, uh, the best educators, coaches, with lots of passion. The other thing is obviously the kids, you know, something that we do these days at the tennis center is to educate the kids that it's important, you, your, uh, your talent is important, but this is not the most important thing. What I think is uh, important is to work hard, to do it day after day, it's not enough just to come on, on Monday and work hard. You need to come on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You need to come every day for years after years. So this is something that the kids, you know, when you have this passion from the kid, you have this passion from the coach and the parent, it's a triangle that uh, it's, uh, this is the way I see it, you know, the best way for success. Um, and uh, this is something I look, when I look on a kid and he wants to be a professional, I want to see a fire on his eyes. I want to see, you know, this passion. I want to see that he's committed to work hard, to live a lot of the other things that kids do these days. And I think today at the tennis centers, when I walk around, I definitely see. I see a good team of people. They're taking care of the kids. Um, and I see good kids. Um, definitely the way I see it. And I joined um, the tennis centers now after many years is because I see this potential. And I always say this. I always say this sentence and remember the time. I really believe, I really believe, and I'm not saying it because now we're talking, I really believe we can have a Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, or somebody at this level from Israel. I really believe it. I, I think if Djokovic is coming from a small country like Serbia, if Dimitrov is coming from Bulgaria, I can give you so many examples from kids that are coming from small countries and they did well, you can do well in Israel. You have the facility, you have the great places, and we're going to do well. I think this is one of the sports that we can have a superstar, uh, a worldwide uh, superstar, and we're going to do that. Um, definitely, we have what it takes at the tennis centers, and uh, we are on the way to do that. 
You know, Andy, another another guy on this call, among all the fire in the eyes of everybody, all 68 or 69 people on the call, is Igal Mostkov, who who um, helped us at iTech achieve something else, which is a broader level of, of champions on the court and off the court. So Igal, just share with us for a moment in the context of what Andy has been telling us, and Andy, your words are very moving and inspiring, I must say. Um, Igal, you're a great success story of iTech as well. Just give us a whoa. Just uh, give us a two-minute. Oh, I, I hope you can hear me. I just uh, I've lost the, the screen. Oh, are we? Just give us a two-minute. Right. Uh, yes, Dan. Okay, a two-minute pressy on 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 how um, iTech has has really helped you turn into a champion. Just if you could yeah, give it to us. absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dan. And uh, I'll try to keep it relatively brief, but. Um, just before I start, I just want to thank everybody who's, who's on the call today for, for taking the time and doing this. Um, I think you guys know and understand how important your contributions are and, and everything you've done for, for the Israeli tennis. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my, my story, I guess, begins uh, in a little town called uh, Arad. So it's, it's a little town in, in south of Israel. It's about 45 minutes from Beersheba. Um, I feel I feel like if if you've been to the Dead Sea, you you certainly pass the the, the town. Um, it's it's one of the ways to get down there. Um, so the way I I was recruited to to tennis to begin with is um, I was uh, I was at uh, elementary school and um, um, and some people from the Ala Tennis Center came and uh, you know they brought rackets and they brought a little net and they would put us outside and. You know, they said, oh, gym class, you can either play soccer and run around or you have an opportunity to try something else like tennis. So um, my parents are immigrants from from Russia. And for them, you know, when I was a kid, when I was like five or six years old, they wanted me to go to gymnastics like any Russian family would want their son. Um, but I picked up a tennis racket. I loved it. And I started going to the tennis center. And my family was always challenged, I would say, financially. Um, so, you know, a lot of the questions were asked, like, well, you know, how much is it for everyday practices? And, like, how, you know, rackets, shoes, all these things, they, they add up uh, tremendously. And, and the sport is very expensive. So, um, you know, we, we had to seek a little bit of help. And the tennis center helped sort of day one. And they want me to be there. And I pretty much lived on the court, like. I would finish school, I would go to the tennis courts, I would leave at like 10 p.m. every single day. Um, and it was great because, you know, it was, it was remarkable for me um, to just kind of keep getting better. I made so, so many friends. Um, and then I think there was a little probably another breaking point where my game was good, but not, I guess, good enough um, to, to accomplish, I guess, uh, you know, a sort of mini career out of it. Um, and I had this opportunity to go and practice in Beersheba, who back then, uh, they had a really competitive program. So, um, again, you know, I had to go out and seek a little help financially. And again, the I ITC came through and, you know, I had an another incredible experience. And then after that, honestly, um, you know, I took another extra step, like Annie was saying, we're playing you know, every day for, for six hours and so on. And at that point, I think I became uh, very competitive, but always in the back of my head, you know, I knew that although I'm a good player, you know, I probably will not be a pro, but I always had this dream to, to go to college and get an education and, you know, people were talking to me about the United States. And for me, it was like, wow, you know, the U.S. of A, like, wow. Um, so um, then I ended up actually going to Amata Shalon and um, I was in their program there. So we literally, um, and that was kind of what back then would be called the, the high performance program where I would live and breathe tennis. I mean, Every day for 10 hours, I would sleep on the tennis courts in Ramat Um So that's kind of how I got my tennis to a point where I could now go and try and seek a scholarship outside, outside Israel. 
Um, and I was very lucky and, and fortunate um, to get a scholarship to go to uh, university in Louisville. Uh, it was a Division II school called Bellarmine. Um, I spent a couple of years there, and then I transferred to Yeshiva University, and both of these things were on a full tennis scholarship. So, I mean, I, you know, it, was, it was unbelievable for me to, to have this opportunity. Um, now it's been six years since I graduated. I moved to New York City. Uh, I have uh, I have a great job. You know, every every time I went to an interview, you know, one of the first things that always came out of my head is like, I'm a tennis player. So it it opened so many incredible doors for me. Um, and now, just this past month, I actually moved from the city to New Jersey. I got married to a beautiful uh, Israeli slash American girl. So I'm, I'm sort of living the dream right now, but it all started, you know, back, back in the day from, from a little childhood, from this little tennis center in Arad. And honestly, there is no way on, on earth that I would be here without your guys' help uh, and, and contribution. So um, although it's not a Grand Slam story, you know, it's, it's, it's something that thousands of kids have been through these programs and gotten this help. Um, so once again, tremendous thank you for, for all your help and contribution because there's so many ways that um, these things may go a little unnoticed or you may not hear about um, people like me, but there, there are thousands of us out there over the years. You go. That's fantastic. When I hear you speak English, it, like I'm, I'm wondering whether you ever had an Israeli accent. Uh, yeah. Well, I can, I can switch. I can switch to the Israeli if it's needed. <laughs> you can hear um, it the way he says Arad. Arad. Arad, Arad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you but, so much, Igal, uh, for that. No, no worries. Th thank it's you. It's really fantastic. Uh, uh, Yoni, uh, here. I saw you uh, here, and thank you ever so much for recruiting all of us to this roundtable call, uh, uh, you know, a big hug out to you and thank you. Um, Hans, just give us, before we go uh, back to, uh, to questions and, and comments from everyone else around the table, we'll start with Len, of course. Uh, Hans, just, give a, just weigh in on this, what you've heard from Andy as our, um, you know, our head of, of, of tennis excellence and, and, and the, uh, the academy. Um, how are you seeing all this and what are our challenges and what are our opportunities going forward? Um, wow. Let me first react on, um, on something that Igal said before I forget. He said, my story is not a Grand Slam story, and I disagree with him. His story is a Grand Slam story. From the point of view of uh, ITEC, that we get a lot of children from any background, any religion, to, uh, to get the passion and the love of tennis, and then to get to college in the United States and, and get a degree through your tennis with a scholarship, it's a Grand Slam story. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Andy's story is a, a Grand Slam story. It's focused on tennis, and he had the, cap the, the capabilities to, to get the best out of it. And it's a remarkable story what he and Yoni uh, did. But for us at, uh, at ITEC to get to college and to get through college, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a Grand Slam story. So um, I, I'm happy that Andy walking around in the center. I see him a lot in the center. I'm so happy that he says that he sees the passion in the eyes of the kids, and he sees that the coaches have a lot of passion. And, and that we definitely have a chance to do uh, well. I'm, I'm with him on that, I, I believe in that. We started last year um, a new corporation with uh, the Israel Tennis Association to build an academy um, that is uh, specialized in bringing children uh, far in tennis, either, either uh, to professional tennis or to go to college. Um, in this coming September, we go one step further. We are going to start with uh, junior academies in, in different centers. Um, basically because we want to show that when you are part of a junior academy, um, to be selected for a junior academy, it means that you have the passion and the talent to do something with tennis, either to go to college or to make it as a professional player. So once you move into the Israel National Tennis Academy, you have a shot to, to become a player and we'll do everything we can to help children to become tennis players. Once you are not on that track to professional tennis, we, from the age of 16, we have a specific college program in, uh, in six different centers where we are helping the kids from, uh, from the age of 16 to 21 to prepare for college and to do the best they can in, in uh, college. Um, so we are preparing in a very professional way to do a lot of different things in tennis. And again, it's important to say that we are doing it with children from all walks of life. 
Um, just to give you an update on what happened uh, this week, we have two girls from our tennis center in um, Tel Aviv, uh, Jennifer and Coral. They are in our college program there. They just got accepted uh, um, into the army with uh, special permission to, to do the army service, but to be, uh, to be sport aid, as, uh, as they say in, in Israel. So they get facilities to make the best out of their career. And uh, they get all the opportunities to go to college. Both, both girls are from a very difficult background. One girl coming from Africa, uh, just with her mother. The other girl also from a single family. They got a lot of help from the ITEC family. And uh, as they had the talent in tennis, they, um, they have now all the chances to go through the army and then to go to college. On the other hand, in this, in this National uh, Tennis Academy, we have uh, at the moment 16 players and about 25% uh, of, of all players in all of our talent development programs are, are getting there with severe scholarships uh, from the ITEC family. So again, on, on, on the girls' side, which is also quite special because in, in Israel tennis, we, we tend to talk a lot about boys, but also here on the girls' side, we have one girl, uh, Karin Alturi. She is from, um, uh, from a Bedouin village very close to Beersheba. She is number one in Israel under 14. She's doing internationally very well. And she moved to Ramat Asheron with her family and she's part of this academy. And the same for Maya Betzalel. She is 15 years old. She is actually number one in Israel under 16. And she's coming from a very poor neighborhood in Tiberias. And uh, she is going to boarding school in Ramat Asheron. She is practicing same story as Andy, same story as Igal. They love tennis, they have passion for tennis, they are the whole day on the court. And um, also those children from difficult backgrounds, they get all the opportunities to use tennis and to do well in life. Right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Hans. Uh, Andy, I'm sure that, that the round table, people have lots of questions for you. Uh, so we'll, let me uh, toss it over to Jackie. Do you want to uh, go back? Was it Len um, that we that asked the question and so quietly Absolutely. waiting? <laughs> Thank you for the waiting, intro. Len. Okay, Jackie. Hi. Hi, my name is Len Rashkin. I'm here on Long Island right now, but I'm from Boca West Country Club. Uh, I co-chair for many years uh, the, ra the round robin that we have with the children, and it's been really v delightful and great working with Yanni and the team. Uh, I, Andy, I have a question. We met, uh, you wouldn't remember me, but I have a picture of you uh, in my Boca West home. Uh, Anti-Semitism. There's not that many Jewish players. Uh, Diego Schwartzman and uh, Scott Lipsky, which you know, he's a family friend, uh, and yourself and a few others. With the spread of anti-Semitism throughout Europe, have you encountered that in any way? Well, it's a great question, uh, Len. It's a great question. Uh, you only love the story, Yoni. You only love the uh, Dubai story. I think which uh, will tell you. During my career, I never felt anything. Really traveling all over the world, never felt anything about we're Jewish or not. It, it really, we always felt safe. And uh, I think that's the beauty of sport. Sport is always above politics and most of the time. And uh, that's the beauty of tennis. It's kind of a bridge that connects all the countries, cultures, and everybody together. And uh, that's, I think, the, the beauty of the sport. Uh, one story I can tell you, maybe if I think about it now, in, through all my career, this is the only thing that maybe I have, was uh, in 2008, nobody knows this. Not too many people know this story. Maybe some of the people here know the story, but most of you don't. In 2008, um, I wanted to go to play in Dubai. I wanted to go and play in Dubai. Um, we won the Australian Open. Me and Yoni, we won the Australian Open in 2008. We were number one in the world for a couple of months. And uh, the Dubai tournament is uh, on March. Uh, second, third week, third week of March. Um, we were number one in the world. It's a big tournament, no tax, which is good for us. So we decided to go and play there. Uh, lots of points. Uh, big man, you say, okay, we want to go and play in Dubai. Now, there's a sports law that no matter what country hosts the tournament, they have to let everybody go and play in this tournament, have the opportunity to play in this tournament. So, we were applying for a visa to Dubai. Um, the Dubai government, well, there was no Israeli sportsman playing in Dubai before. Um, so, I'm talking about 2008. We wanted to go and play. The Dubai government didn't let us go because of a visa and they said no Israeli are accepted in Dubai. 
um, especially not to play sports, and it's going to be a big story. Anyway, nobody knows this, but uh, the ATP, the players organization, uh, kind of convinced us after we bought the ticket for Dubai, um, not to go and play in Dubai. They say, I'm going to open your number one. Why do you have to go make such a mess and play in Dubai? Nobody knows that. And they gave us money, $10,000, uh, not to go there. Uh, they kind of uh, paid the expenses of the tickets that we have to cancel and the refund. Anyway, they said, don't go. You can go and play Memphis in the U.S. You can go play Delray Beach and don't, don't need to go to Dubai. Um, and you know what? In 2008, we didn't make a, such a big deal. We said, okay, you know what? We're only going to play. They don't want us. Let's go and play in the U.S. 2009. Not too many people know. Yoni got injured. I played the Australian Open. I lost in the second round. I didn't defend my points. And I had to go and play in Dubai because those are a lot of points. I wanted to stay in the top 10. It was a very important tournament for me. And now I told the ATP when I was in Australia, they had like two months in advance. I want to go and play in Dubai. This year, I'm not giving up. I'm going to go and I'm playing in Dubai. It's a big tournament. I know I have the the right to go and play there. And the ATP did everything they could for me to go and play in Dubai. As I said, the men's tournament is the second week, the third week of March. The female's tournament, the WTA, is the second week of March. Shahar Peer, in 2009, she wanted to go and play there. She applied for the visa. The week before the tournament, they didn't let her go because she is yeah. Israeli. Anyway, uh, they got punished from the WTA. They got 300 thousand euros fine and the ATP told them if you are not going to give Andy a visa for Dubai we're going to cancel the tournament now a fine of 300 thousand euros they can accept the Dubai to cancel the tournament it's a lot of millions of uh, of a loss and they, they, they didn't they couldn't accept it so they said we're going to give Andy a visa and um, the second they said they're going to give me a visa um, I had a whole journey, which is crazy. I will tell you this. I never had an experience something similar to that in my life. The second I said I can go to play in Dubai, I couldn't obviously play for a flight from Israel. There are no flights from Israel to Dubai. The secret service, the Mossad, they called me and they said, Andy, we know, I don't know how they knew it. Andy, we know you want to go to play in Dubai. You can go to play. <laughs> I have no idea who told them. How did they know? That's why they are the Mossad. Anyway, they called me and I told them, uh, okay, I'm not going to go and play there. It's okay. I know it's dangerous. Nobody did it before. Okay, okay. And I knew I'm going to go there. Anyway, I flew to Paris. I bought a ticket, uh, Emirates, from Paris. And uh, I decided I'm going to go and play in Dubai. I'm going to the counter after I bought the ticket. I go to the counter of Emirates. And I'm talking about three hours before the flight. And the lady is looking at my passport and she said, you Israeli, you can't go to Dubai. I said, no, no, I have the permissions, I have everything. The visa. No, no, you can't. Anyway, they hold me like this for two hours in the airport. The second before the flight closes uh, to take off, they say, okay, you come with us and you can go on the flight. I'm telling you, the second I was sitting on this flight, I had to buy obviously a business flight. I was sitting like this, shaking. You can't even imagine I was shaking. I didn't know what I'm flying to. I'm like, you know, a, a tennis player that want to play tennis and that's it. I'm going into this airplane. I thought everybody was going to be Arabs and they want to kill me. So I started to speak Spanish. <laughs> I was born in Uruguay. I started speaking in Spanish. So they wouldn't know I'm from Israel. The second we landed in Dubai, the second we landed in Dubai, I can tell you everybody had to stay seated. Everybody remained seated. And like 15 guys stepping into the airplane and they took me. First of all, they took me out. They took my passport. They can't stamp my passport because Israel, as I said, they are not allowed to go into Dubai. The second I landed, I became like, I'm telling you, like the prime minister. I, I had like 20 people bodyguarding me. Going, I couldn't hold my, my, my baggage, you know, I couldn't take my luggage. They said, what's your luggage point on it? We're going to take it. We go out of the airport and I have like three cars, bulletproof cars, taking me to the hotel. Now what? The players would stay in one hotel. I'm talking about like 50 players with their coaches and everybody. And I had to stay in a different hotel, like by myself. They blocked the whole floor only for me. The whole floor. I'm telling you, they're like, you have like, I don't know, like 50, 100 doors in the floor, all floor bodyguards. And I have like 24 7 bodyguards behind my room in my garden where I was sleeping. 
I couldn't use obviously the name in the hotel. I was Mr. Smith. I couldn't use RAM, obviously. I know credit cards, nothing. Telling you the experience I had. Obviously, I'm telling you to go to the hotel from the airport. I, I, I realized that only when I, I lost, it was like two minutes away. They drove me like two hours until we got to the, to the room. It was crazy, crazy experience. I, I had one day, I remember, we're going for a restaurant. I'm going with all these bodyguards, you know, go to the restaurant and we sit and you see like, you know, 60, 70 people in the restaurant. We're having dinner together, laughing. The second I was standing up for the bit, you know, you see 50 people standing up together with me, everybody undercover. <laughs> it was crazy, crazy experience. <laughs> going for a massage, obviously, you know, I'm going to take a massage. So I, I could stay only at the hotel, going for the massage, getting into the room with 15 people to have a massage, 50 people touching the masseur, checking in that he doesn't have knives and everything. The guy, I'm telling you, I, I remember until today, the guy was about to do a massage and he was shaking. The guy is touching me and he's shaking. <laughs> he thought I'm a, the son of the shake or something. <laughs> crazy, crazy experience. My match, obviously, I couldn't talk to my partner. Um, I was staying in a different hotel. I was playing with uh, Uliet from Zimbabwe. So I couldn't communicate with him. I had to communicate with the chief of the security. He had to communicate to the tournament. Tournament had to communicate with the player. And it was a mess to communicate. They block a court just for me. I couldn't play on the normal court. So they blocked a the court with the metal detected. No people were allowed to come, only 100 people. They took their phones so nobody could take pictures. I couldn't play with the flag. Normally, when you play, you have the, the name of the country next to your name. And they didn't put the name of the country. They put just Ram. And it was a, it was a big issue. If you go Google Andy Ram Dubai, you see I was the first Israeli to play. Now when I look on it, then, you know, at the time I didn't think it was that important. But now when I look backwards, it was the most important thing I think I did in my career, you know, to go and play in Dubai. Since I've been and playing Dubai, I was the first Israeli to play a sports event in Dubai. There are Israelis going into Dubai and play different kinds of sports. If it's bike, judo, all kind. Israeli play tennis there, Shahaber, Yoni Erlich, myself again, I, I flew there. So it was something very important, you know, it was a statement that I, I was fighting for and it was very important. That was the only time I felt maybe, you know, that I'm Israeli and they don't accept me in the country. But it was a huge experience for me, you know, like I uh, felt like a prime minister for a week. Um, so, yeah, that's that, uh, the only, you know, crazy experience I had as, in, as an Israeli. But, uh, Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. Other than that, always Thank proud. You, yeah. Andy, in light of that out-of-body experience, uh, Erwin Shore has two questions for you. Yeah. One, do you miss the competition? And two, who were your tennis idols growing up in addition to Yoni Ehrlich on the Israeli side and worldwide? <laughs> um, my idols were um, growing up, first of all, the Israelis. I can tell you uh, Amos Manzov growing up and going to watch him play the big tournament in Ramata Sharon Tennis Stadium, driving all the way. You know what, Jackie? I remember still until today, when I was a little kid, I had two dreams, really, I had two big dreams. One of them, I remember looking at Wimbledon and you're asking about idols. So I was growing up on uh, Stefan Edberg. Most of you, I guess, you know Stefan Edberg, you know, seven volley, classy. And this is what my, you know, looking and growing up, I was a seven volley. This is my, my strength, aggressive player. So I was looking at Wimbledon and saw Stefan Edberg, Boris Becker, those are the players I was growing up on, kind of. And I wanted to play in Wimbledon one day. Uh, so this is one dream. The other one, I remember my father when I was seven years old, he was taking me from Jerusalem to Ramata Sharon Tennis Center to the big stadium. Um, and I remember myself until today, I still remember myself sitting there in the stadium, watching Amos Mandov, Shlomo Glickstein, Gilad Bloom, all our Israeli idols at the time. And remembering myself, telling my father, Daddy, I want one day to come and represent Israel in Davis Cup. Um, I remember that growing up on those players. Overseas, as I said, I was very like into seven volleys. So I said, like, I think uh, Stefan Edberg. And one guy that I liked uh, when I was 12, I started uh, liking him, was Andre Agassi. I can tell you that uh, I never played even similar to him. Nothing close to Agassi, but I liked the way he dressed and the way he was 
walking on the court and all the the pink shorts, you know. The, and so I had few idols, as like like any other kid um, growing up. Um, I can tell you that uh, those uh, you know dreams that I had, one of them. Um, um, I was very lucky to achieve and not only compete in Wimbledon, I was lucky to win Wimbledon. And uh, this is uh, one big dream that uh, I could achieve. And the other dream, um, I think it's one of my biggest moments of my career. I have few, um, I'll be happy to share some, but one of them is definitely Davis Cup here in Israel, um, representing Israel. Uh, you know, the moments you remember when you finish a career, such a long career, uh, I played hundreds of matches, hundreds of matches, win, lose, lost. Uh, the matches I remember most, those are the matches I represented Israel at the Olympics and at Davis Cup. Those are the moments you play for Israel and those are the moments I remember most. Uh, I have great mo memories like from big wins. Uh, my biggest moment of my career, I always say, was in Davis Cup here in Israel um, in front of 11,000 people uh, beating Russia in the quarterfinal of Davis Cup, getting into the semifinals for the first time in the history of Israel, uh, making it with, talking about the tennis center, with five guys that each one of them grew up in a different tennis center. Dudi Sela in Kiryat Shmona, Yoni Ehrlich and Noam Okon in Haifa Tennis Center, Arel Levy Ramata Sharon Tennis Center, me in the Jerusalem Tennis Center, Amir Haddad Jaffa Tennis Center, and we all representing Israel, bringing such a, you know, a, great moment for the, not only for tennis, for sports in Israel. And that was a very unique moment uh, for me, which I'll never, never forget. You know what, uh, talking about it, you know, I'm like so excited, excited. I didn't prepare it, uh, Jackie, but if talking about it, I can tell you that maybe I have this moment here. Can I share a moment here, uh, Jackie? Yeah, oh, sure. absolutely, yeah. go for it. You guys, you have to excuse me because it's very spontaneous. It's in Hebrew, but I have it on my computer. I have to tell you before I put the, the video, if I can try to do it. Um, I have to tell you the story before that. Um, it was the quarterfinal of Davis Cup playing against Russia. Uh, Russia and Israel in tennis, you know, they, they have like tens of number ones. They won Davis Cup many times. They came to Israel. Uh, we were up two love after the first day. And me and Yoni, my partner, we need to play um, on Saturday. Uh, the doubles. Um, we knew if we're going to win this match, we're going to make history and we're going to be the first Israeli team to make the semi final in, in Davis Cup. So it was a huge, huge match for us. Lots of pressure on our shoulders after they, after they won the two matches and all the country is looking at us. 11,000 people in the stands. And I'll try to share with you because I told you before, um, the moment I'll show you it's in Hebrew because it's the commentator speaking in Hebrew, but you're going to hear the crowd and I'll tell you after something about uh, this match, another word. Jackie, I'll try to do the screen, okay? I gave you permission. Open my screen sharing for video clip, share computer sound, optimize screen, right? Yes. And now let's make a share. One second. You, you can see the You can yeah. see it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, listen to this. Match point, three. Still on the serve of Russia. Kadima, Yoni. Kadima, Yoni. Kadima, Yoni. Match point, Sigmar, Davis.
see that, Jackie? Yes, it was beautiful. So, Amazing. Uh, wait a second. Yeah. Stop sharing. Okay, so anyway, I told you that uh, when they asked me what's my biggest uh, achievement of my career, Wimbledon, News Op, uh, whatever, Roland Garros you want. This moment that you just saw, it was my biggest moment of my career. As I told you, as a seven-year-old kid, my dream was to represent Israel in Davis Cup. Can you imagine standing there in front of 11,000 people to this, make this history? 11,000 people at the end of the match calling my name. And the only, so this was a special moment for me. And uh, I, I watched this moment, you know, I, I feel the excitement, still feel it. So when you ask me if I missed it, I miss those moments. I don't miss the practices, waking up at six o'clock and practice for seven hours, travel, staying in India, hotels, go and miss my family. No, but those moments of Davis Cup, the special moment I experienced was Davis Cup in uh, Fort Lauderdale, in, uh, sorry, in uh, Florida, when we played there, my last match of my career. Davis Cup are very emotional moments, which I miss. And uh, yeah, that great moment. Andy, thank you. I think that brought chills and tears. Chills to our arms and tears to our eyes to watch that video. Thank you for sharing it. And you mentioned that Davis Cup was your highlight. It was among your highlights. Um, Yona Yair, Yoni's mom, is on the call. Um, and as we many of us know, she was very instrumental along working with Yoni Yair here in the States to put together Davis Cup in Argentina. Um, during the Gaza incursion. And would you like to speak about that experience a little bit? Uh, me? You want me to speak a little yep, bit about yep, the Davis Cup? Yep, yep. Okay, the so I'll tell you what. Playing in I'll, 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 I'll tell you definitely. It's a good question, Jackie. Thanks for bringing it up because um, in 2014, 2014, um, that was my retirement year. I said, this is my last match. And I want to retire the, uh, as playing in Israel, Davis Cup in Israel. This was my dream, playing in front of those, as you saw, this full stadium, everybody is singing my name and finishing my last match here in Israel. 2014, unfortunately, we had in July this uh, war uh, that uh, the ATP, sorry, the ITF didn't uh, let us play Davis Cup here in Israel. Obviously, Yoni and Yona, which are the best thing happened uh, to tennis in Israel. Not too many people talk about it, about what they did and do for Israel tennis. No words can describe, you know. Uh, so once again, what they did was magic and they put up a great uh, event um, in the U.S. You know, not too many people know when they ask us, the players, they ask us, where do you want to play? You can, because we were supposed to play in Israel. Davis Cup should be our advantage, home advantage. And they ask us, you want to play in Bulgaria, which is close to Israel, we can build a fast court. We can play in Romania, which is also not far from it. We can play in Greece. We can play in Cyprus. Everything is an hour, two hours flight from Israel. We can fly, practice, have a great surface. And we came up with the idea, no, we want to play in the U.S., in Florida, where we're going to feel the closer to home. Florida is where we always feel closer, the most closer we can feel to Israel. The people, the crowd, the community, you guys, everybody. You can't even describe you the meaningful of the crowd in Davis Cup. This is the advantage, the crowd. So this is how we decided to play in the U.S., far away from Israel. And it's a huge log logistics. You only can tell you about the logistics, but we wanted to play in Florida in front of, of our home crowd. And this is how we decided. So anyway, we're going to Florida to play, and I knew it's my last Davis Cup match. This is gonna be my last match. And so we go, we went to this tie after one all against Argentina. Argentina, it's a huge team. And we played the, the match, me and Yoni. And I remember it was maybe 50 degrees hot and 100% humidity. It was crazy to play. I was out of shape already, and getting into the third set, uh, to the fifth set, and um, 4-1 or 4-2, I was cramping all body cramp. I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I was walking on the court somehow, I don't know from what power, serving for the match, walking. I couldn't jump anymore. I just pushed the serve. Yoni, my partner, is all over the net. 
we're getting to the match point. I'm serving like this, I'm telling you, like, 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 I'm, like I'm gonna serve when I'll be 90 years old, like this. I'm serving my first serve, and Yoni is all over the net, and we're winning the point. The guy's missing the shot, and I'm lying like this on the floor. My last point of my career, this is the last point as a professional tennis player, and suddenly laying on the floor there in Florida, my last point of my maybe, I don't know, 29 years of tennis, uh, suddenly all the thoughts were running in my mind, you know, like people say, when before you die, I never die. All your history going through your mind. This is exactly what happened to me in this moment. All the history of my tennis, growing up, Jerusalem tennis, everything what I've been through, injuries, everything, everything, everything went through my mind. And I started, you know, to get excited. I won't forget in my life, this is something that I told Ian Fruman. You all know Ian Fruman, one of our founders. People came and hugged me and I was laughing to everybody, even my mother. I flew my mother especially for, for, to Florida for one day, just for the match. She came for the match and came back to Israel. She came for 10 hours to Florida and it's a long flight. But it was important for me that uh, the most, uh, I don't know, uh, the most, uh, how, how do I say, important person in my life would be there uh, in this moment, my mother. So I, it was important for me to flirt. Anyway, after the match, I was hugging everybody and laughing and very happy. And when I was hugging Ian Fruman, um, he was sitting next to me. Everybody, you know, like, after I won this match, imagine like 50 people from the team, they all took their shirts off and they put the shirt with uh, my picture and the words, thank you, Andy. And I became emotional and people came to the bench to take pictures with me. And I was like taking one after the other and hugging them and smiling to the camera and one after the other. And then suddenly Ian Fruman came sitting next to me. And even now when I talk about it, I start to be a little bit, you know, with goosebumps. I, I hugged him and I start to cry. I start to cry, I couldn't hold myself. I realized that because of this person Ian and his vision, I'm sitting here having this unbelievable moment, unbelievable career, and I just couldn't stop hugging him. And I hug him and I tell him, Ian, thank you, Ian, thank you, Ian, thank you, Ian, thank you. And I became so emotional. And this was a big closure for me, you know, from all my career. It was very special. Happy that I finished uh, my last match <laughs> as a winner. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so like I said, Jackie, it was a very meaningful moment in Florida, last match. And like I said, the Davis Cup match, you do, I'll never forget. It's, it's a moment that it's here. I'll take it forever. And I don't think any of us will ever forget it, Andy. Um, it was an incredibly emotional moment. And um, we definitely want to thank Ian and Bill for their vision and for building the tennis centers. And um, yeah. we hope you, you continue to get a lot of nachas from your investment. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. I'll turn it over to Wendy now. Thank you, Andy. I think we all have such a huge smile on our face. And thank you, Dan, Egal, and Hans. This was really fantastic. Um, we had a vision during this COVID time to bring Israel through the lens of Israel tennis and education centers to our donors. And that's how we created this Lunch and Learn series. We've had over 500 people participate, so it has been incredibly rewarding for all of us. So on, on that note, I want to take this opportunity to tell you about our event on July 28th at 7 p.m. You can all write after we're done, if you haven't already, RSVP, get your tickets. Um, it's a virtual evening of art and comedy um, celebrating iTech with world-renowned artist Michael Israel and comedian Sarge benefiting the Children's Emergency Relief Fund to provide essential services for at-risk youth. Um, so please, it's going to be a blast. Anyway. The website, Wendy, I'll just give out the website to register. It's itecartandcomedy.com. Um, and our next Lunch and Learn is August 12th. The topic is, is Israel the world's rainbow nation? a rare conversation with Israeli Arab leader Youssef Haddad on challenges and opportunities for Jewish Arab relations in Israel. So please don't miss that. It's gonna be an amazing discussion and thank you everyone for joining us. Beth, thank you.
Be well and be healthy. Bye bye. Later. Bye. Thanks. Bye. bye. Thank you. Toda, Andy. Toda.